It's a day in autumn that finally feels like autumn, sort of. But you're not too busy thinking about autumn. You have more important things to think about. Wonder, excitement, discovery. Turning off the path, you approach the entrance to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside are riotous conversations about faith, the arts, and a small town in, well, it's not quite clear what state that small town is, but we'll get to that later. At a table in the far corner by the fire are three people. Two of them are trying to pitch a wild idea to the third person, but more on that in a later episode. That's a teaser. That's right, this is the Believe to See a show, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is dedicated merely to a renaissance of the Christian imagination. So we do this through a variety of different programs, um, events, and all other things going on all throughout the year. We have a big uh, conference every uh, spring, and we have the Arts Guild. We have all sorts of different programs. Check out anselmsociety.org if you want to find out more about us and our other two podcasts. What? And if you want, maybe you could, you know, rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. That'd be cool. I don't know. Whatever. I don't want to tell you what to do. Uh, But today's episode, I am feeling very, very excited for a lot of different reasons. But before I do that, let's um, bring in one of our co-hosts today, Brian Brown, El Capitan. Brian, how are you doing? I am well. Thanks for having me on again. Oh, thank you for coming back on. Now, on the fun podcast. This is the fun podcast. This is how I, I pitch Brian to get him to come on the show, because he is the host of Redeemed Imagination, which is a great podcast, but it's very serious. It's, it's, it requires it a lot of thinking. It's heavy stuff. Yeah, so this is like the, the cure to it. It's it's sort of like the acidic thing that takes away the alkaline thing, and it, it evens it out in your, <laughs> in your mind. It uh, balances all the humors, if you want to go like medieval doctoring stuff. There's just something about when you're talking theology, it's hard to take it back once you've said it. Mm. Bleed a little more onto the arts side, there's more room to play. There you go. There you go. So welcome to the fun table and welcome, I'll I'll tell the listeners this, this is a brand new recording space. Hopefully you can tell in the sound quality. And if you can't tell, don't tell me because it'll just crush me. Uh, But you may have been able to tell the past few episodes have been a little lower on the audio quality and that is Well, there's no one else I can blame, so obviously it's my fault. Uh, A couple reasons for that. First of all, we've been looking for a new home for a while. We were recording at Marcus's place, but Marcus stabbed me in the back, moved to Portland just to spite me. That's what I assume happened. And because he did that, uh, we haven't had a regular recording location, which makes it tricky. And also, I am terrible with tech and recording equipment, so I screwed up the past couple. But I spent so much time working on this. And I'm pretty sure this is all going to work this time. And again, if it doesn't, don't tell me. Uh, so because of that, I, you know, I'll just say you're welcome. And after doing that, let's invite our other guest, the third member of the table officially. So Jennifer England, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, thank you. And I think this will be a really fun episode. I've been meaning to do this episode for a while. So going to find out all sorts of things about you. But first, let's start with the things about you involving Anselm. What what is your role here at Anselm? I'm not actually sure I know, but I work... (laughs) (laughs) I didn't mean to tap into anything, but... uh, I don't think I have an official title, but I do work... Secret weapon, I think. (laughs) Yeah, something, you know, behind the scenes ninja. Um, I work on the operations team, and really I just do things that I really enjoy logistics, um, planning, thinking ahead, trying to figure out where things fit. Um, That's where my brain usually goes. I like to think about 10 steps ahead at all times. And I like to think of life as a really great big puzzle and fitting all those pieces in and trying to figure out how that all works. So that's kind of what I do with Ansem. I was drawn to it because I'm an artist. I'm married to an artist. And uh, we always tend to be drawn to those types of things in our lives. So that's kind of how I found Ansem. Wow. The, the fact that there are people out there who enjoy doing logistics and details and planning ahead, I, I can't tell you how, how good that makes me feel because I, I'm that poor sap who you're doing the planning ahead for who's like, oh, I can't believe this idiot didn't think of this. So on behalf of those idiots across the world, uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, <laughs> for joining Anselm. We really appreciate it. And also, you're here kind of in a dual capacity because you are with Anselm, but you also work with Cue the music. Dun 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 dun. 
You work for Adventures in Odyssey. That was really good music. Thank you. Never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like Danielle. <laughs> but, so for those of us who don't know, and I'm guessing there's probably a wide spectrum of folks listening to this uh, when it comes to Adventures in Odyssey. I'm sure some people grew up listening to it and they can quote whole episodes off the top of their head. And there's some people who have probably never even heard of it. So please give a short pithy definition of what Adventures in Odyssey is that appeals equally to both groups. Sure. So Adventures in Odyssey is a radio drama. It started over 30 years ago, 1987. And it puts Christian truths in an artistic way, in a way that kind of is easy for people to understand. It teaches people through stories. And it especially is aimed towards children ages 8 to 12, but we have listeners from 0 to 93. You know about the 93-year-old. We do. They contact us. We have people that will contact us and say, hey, I'm 80-some years old. I listen to Adventures and Odyssey every night. And they'll say, hey, like, when is Connie going to marry Mitch? And different things like that. We're like, wow. That's you're really, amazing. You're really involved in this show, aren't you? <laughs> did Connie ever marry Mitch? She did not. And she will never marry Mitch, sadly. Whoa. That, okay, they were going through their thing. When, I'll, I might as well give my background now. Um, so I grew up listening to Adventures in Odyssey. I'm in that camp. So between the ages of like, what, 5 and 15, all of them made through that time. I have basically an encyclopedic knowledge of, and I can probably finish any quotation that you start. After that, I sort of fell off because, you know, angsty teenager and all of that. Uh, so this is very cool for me. And also, uh, j- just another quick quick little word. Like, uh, I think it's so cool because um, Adventures in Odyssey, it's done by Focus on the Family, which, again, lots of people have opinions on. But basically, I think no matter your opinion of uh, Focus on the Family, that doesn't really matter because Adventures in Odyssey did something very cool, very unique, and presented... I think they're just a very interesting example of what it means to create Christian art in a very different medium. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, Jennifer, I'm appointing you official Adventures Not a Sea historian. How did this all start and why is it? Well, as someone who's worked for Odyssey for a year and a half, I know a whole lot about this. <laughs> but actually, I what I really know is because I started listening to this as a kid. Mm-hmm. I think I started listening to Odyssey within probably the first year of it coming out. Mm-hmm. And I listened to it just like you all the time. And I listened to the same episodes over and over again because I grew up in the age of cassette tapes and not CDs. <laughs> so, Did you ever have your cassette tapes warp in the car if you left them in over summer? Yeah, and I got so really sad. good at saving those those ones that got like a little bit of tear or you know a little crinkle in oh, it so the cassette surgeon okay I was so I would get a new album for like every birthday every Christmas and I'd listen to those same episodes over and over and over again and so for me as a child Odyssey was very magical it was this magical place that I went to in my imagination and it really started my whole love of stories So if you look back at the people who started it, many of which still work on the show today, I'm definitely one of the newest members of the team. Many of the people have been there since the beginning over 30 years ago and are still creating and still making a really imaginative product even after all this time, which I think is amazing as artists. They are producing 24 episodes a year, which is, you know, throwback to old TV series, how long those used to be. And that's a lot of content to create, to stay imaginative, to stay creative, and to keep your audience engaged. So a lot of those people kind of got in a room way back in the day because they wanted to create something for kids. They wanted to create something that was full of imagination, that showed that the Christian life was a great adventure. And I think that's one of the most appealing things about Odyssey is that it doesn't approach Christianity as this dull, dry subject. It approaches it as this great adventure that we are all living together. And it shows kids that the life that we have is something grand and that God has grand plans in store for us. And so that as we kind of embrace our um, destiny in Christ, that that is this great adventure that we're going to live through the rest of our lives. And I'll, I'll sort of add the things I learned from scouring their, I think, 10th or 15th year anniversary history book. But first, I want to put Brian on the spot. Brian, I assume you listened to Adventures in Odyssey, or were, were you not raised Christian? Uh, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> 
gosh, I don't know what this, what percentage Christian this would make me, but I had one cassette tape. We took, we took a, we took a trip down to visit Focus on the Family when it was in Pomona. And I came home with one souvenir Adventures in Odyssey cassette tape, which in fairness, we did listen to extensively. And occasionally we would hear the rest on the radio here and there, but we weren't faithful listeners. We got more into it as Focus branched out into other radio dramas. So my Odyssey knowledge is extremely uh, deep and not wide at all. <laughs> You're I, an expert you on that. I can quote you the one episode yeah. extensively. So, what, what was the one episode? <laughs> oh gosh, it was about making the right kinds of friends. There was a, some, one of the kids was hanging out with somebody that Wit didn't really approve of and had this sort that of- could be a lot of I know, episodes. it was. I, 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 can, I can remember it. isolated lines here uh, A kid there. has a problem, yeah. they come to Wit's End, Mr. Whitaker gives some advice, and is, I'm describing every episode. You are, yeah. Okay, yes. But you knew that they started in Pomona. That's like, you know, high level right there. So, yeah, get some points for that. What there was mean? a jaywalking scene. What? <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, Brian, true, proving he's uh, one of the OG uh, Odyssey fans. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, just a little bit more background, again, for those who may not be familiar. Adventures in Odyssey, it takes place in a sort of small Midwestern town. Uh, Jennifer, I'm probably going to do a lot of quizzing to see if you can tell me exactly what state it's in. I have my theory, which I will share with you soon. But it takes place in this small Midwestern town, and it takes place around this uh, soda shop called Wit's End, which is uh, founded and run by this guy, John Avery Whitaker, who's this uh, sort of slightly older guy who's very wise and sage and looks like a mixture between C.S. Lewis and Mark Twain. That was from one of the books. And there's a recurring cast of kids, other people who help out at the store. It's a large cast of characters, and it's been going on forever and ever and ever, and it is still going. We've gone through, are we on our third or fourth, Mr. Whitaker? Third. Third. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and Growing up, I was convinced that he was played by Dr. Dobson, by the way. <laughs> so this is a nice little bit of trivia. The original Mr. Whitaker, his name was Hal Smith. He's most famous for uh, a recurring role he had in the Andy Griffith show. He was Otis the Town Drunk. This is true? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Puts he, a whole new spin on it. He was also, I believe, in like actual radio dramas back when that was a really big oh, thing. That's cool. A lot of our original cast was because they kind of came out of that generation. We should talk about that. Oh, that is something we should yeah. talk about. Uh, radio drama history. That's our next episode, Brian. Dang it. You are <laughs> skipping ahead. Uh, Good teaser. Oh, guys. I, I, you guys are keeping the break the fourth wall. I'm trying to be all smooth and polished here. <laughs> You know, I'm the serious podcast host. But anyway, something I really appreciate about Adventures in Odyssey is it was, it did get going in like the mid 80s, which in the world of radio dramas was definitely a downtime, especially in the United States. In, in Britain, they, they sort of have this undercurrent going the whole time. But in the United States, golden age is from, I think, like the late 30s to the early 60s. And it's really, it was sort of a dead art form at that time. But the folks at Adventures in Odyssey, uh, they actually they just worked at Focus on the Family, got this going as something that was just completely unique. So when it was going, it was basically one of a kind. Is that accurate, Jennifer? I would say so. I knew of some other radio dramas. They were Christian radio dramas at the time, but I don't think any of them quite matched the same quality as Adventures in Odyssey, which is why it's lasted over 30 years and kind of wiped away the competition from that time period. And Crushing the competition. I know. And I think part of it is because they had a lot of artistic integrity mm -hmm. and they created a really good product. And the people that were involved did a really good job making something that was um, not only appealing to their demographic, but wide audiences and doing it such, in such a quality way that people that weren't in their demographic were listening and loving it. What does that look like from your perspective at a, at a process level? I mean, there's sort of level one, which is what even goes into creating 24 episodes a year, you said. But on another level, there's when you have a moral element to it and when it's coming out of an organization that has a moral imperative the way almost any religious organization would, what does that look like, the dynamic between creative freedom and moral telos, I guess? I think a lot of it has to do with the quality of people that are involved in the project. I've worked in a lot of different ministries, and if you work in ministry, you know that you're not always going to have 
the best experience with people because people are people no matter where they are. And so when I came into this team, I was very pleased to see what quality people they were. So they weren't only great artists, but they were great people. And I think because of that and their own character and who they are, their art shows that. And so as they are creating, they're creating out of their well, out of what they have built into themselves Mm. and who they are. So the centric genius element matters. Yeah, I think so. Because the people that create, they have a lot of freedom in what they do and a lot of creative freedom because they've earned that trust and because of Mm -hmm. the people that they are and the kind of artists that they are. And I think that that's really unique. I think that's hard to find, both as a person creating, finding an environment where you can have that freedom to really create, but also um, from an organization that, you know, does have a goal in, you know, how they're presenting and what they're saying. And I think that they work really well together. And that's, I think, very rare and very unique. Well, you can see how it could very easily fall into a number of different traps. For instance, each one of the episodes will have like a lesson. You know, this one's about self-control. This one's about humility. This one's about, you know, it's et cetera. So it's really easy to get in a situation where it's like basically a, a moral allegory where it gets very dry and boring. Like, okay, we'll teach this virtue and, you know, this virtue's good and non-virtues are bad. But wait against that. If you try to make it too morally complicated, that will not be something that would be in keeping with the voice of the ministry or with the the age demographic. And I'm trying to put myself in one of the writers trying to make something that has some sort of moral message, but not in a way that's boring or preachy, that is interesting and, you know, sometimes funny, sometimes suspenseful, sometimes sad, but not in a way that would fall askew of this, this kind of tightrope you have to walk. So how do you all do that? And, Do you ever just think about jumping off the (laughs) tightrope? Well, thankfully, I don't write for the show, so I don't have to worry about that as much as the writers do. But I do get to sit in on all their writers' meetings, and it's a really fascinating process. So I'm having not worked in a TV situation, I would probably lightly compare it to working on a TV series. There's a writer's room. They get together and they talk and they discuss stories. They also pitch ideas, and those can be torn apart or be given different direction and so all the writers have pretty thick skin like they've got to be able to come in bring their idea and then watch it kind of get torn apart watch it grow or watch it just completely get tossed to the side so I think they bring a lot of strength in the numbers of people that are working on the show together Mm. also in the number of experience years so most of the writers have been writing 20 plus years for the show. So they have a very good grasp of who their audience is, of why they're writing and what they're writing. And they're incredibly creative people. So when I read a new script from them, uh, I see new ideas all the time. And we're on 870th episode at this point. So there's a lot of episodes to work with. Um, We just brought in a new writer apprentice, and so I'm watching kind of that process because we are very unique. There are not a lot of other areas like us, so we can't just hire someone from another radio drama like us. So when we hire someone new, we have to kind of train them to write in our genre, to write the way that we write. And it's very different. So I'm kind of getting to see that a little bit in play these last few months of just kind of seeing how they mold the scripts and how they kind of take it from idea to finished creation. And it's a really fascinating, interesting process. And I do really think it is very similar to probably a television series would be. The writers do work on their own a lot, but then they kind of always come back together and they always critique each other's work. Interesting. So my impression would be that in some regards it would be really advantageous to have sort of this whole genre to yourself for so long. That's probably not as true now as it used to be. But in some regards, I'm guessing that would be very complicated, and especially in the fact that how do you get people with experience? So like you just mentioned, the writer's apprentice. Be interested to see what their background was. It surely isn't in writing Christian radio dramas. 
so for that or just in terms of voice actors all these other people where do you find people who are experienced with this sort of thing so for our writers, we just find experienced and good writers. That's really what we're looking for. As far as actors, that's actually my realm. So I work in casting. And so my job is to find actors in Hollywood. So we actually work with actors that are in the AFTRA or SAG, and they are union. So because we are actually a union show. So I work with about 15 agencies in California, and I work with them to find all our new talent. So I'm actually casting six shows right now. I've got 25 regular actors I'm hiring for this, and then 25 actors I'm casting for this. And they range anywhere from children from Honduras to Scottish people from the early 1930s to American children in the 1920s. So we have a lot of diverse shows, which can be a little difficult. California is not super diverse in voice talent. Doesn't have a lot of 1920s children running around. It really doesn't, <laughs> no. And it really doesn't have a lot of children with accents. So what, Really? Yeah, no, that's Ella. crazy. But that's yeah, funny. no, I've had to like really search for kids sometimes huh. that have accents because most of them are trying to sound Californian. And that's, <laughs> even if they've moved from somewhere else, they're being trained to sound Californian and not to sound like their native dialect, which is what we are looking for usually. I have lots of actors' questions, but before I do, to show that I'm a hard-hitting uh, podcast host, I need to ask, for writers, you said you wanted them who are experienced and good. Experienced at what? So it really kind of depends on... Oh, that's not I an know. answer either. Well, I mean, we'll put the caveat out there. I don't <laughs> hire people to write, so that's not my realm. So I've sat in on interviews, and I've watched other people interview the writers, but I don't actually make those decisions. So what I would say I've observed in just watching it is they're really looking for people who are flexible writers, who have really thick skin, who are able to take conflicting ideas and turn it into a product. So usually if you sit and listen to a writer give a pitch, you're gonna have six different opinions on where this script should go, or even just brainstorming, oh, what if you, have you thought about this? What are we gonna do over here? So you need someone who's able to move flexibly within their own ideas. And that can be tricky. It's hard to find people, especially writers who are used to working alone. Writers tend to work on their own a lot. Tend to be isolated weirdos, confirmed. Yes. yes. So you have to be able to work with a team and a team of people who've been doing the business for a very long time and really know their stuff. So you have to kind of be willing to be the weakest person in the room. And that takes some character to bring someone in like that. So, Brian, I'm trying to get her to give, like, a bullet point resume for Perspective Odyssey writers. I can't. Maybe you should give a shot at it. It's rough. Well, and she's given her an escape, <laughs> uh, herself an escape door, which is she doesn't actually hire them. So, I mean, I we can push and push and push, and she'll just keep going out that escape door. It's interesting. I mean, let's, maybe if we take a, one step back, what you've just described is pretty rare for a writer to be that flexible because mm -hmm. if you grow up wanting to be a writer you probably don't that's not the person that you idealize your heroes are probably not people like that they're probably tortured souls uh, <laughs> who spent a lot of time locked in a garret somewhere and of course they used the word garret and I have a garret in my backyard yeah <laughs> <laughs> so to get from your aspirational ideal as a writer to that I mean usually you have to have been through a fair bit. Either you, you had a first job out of college that sort of rocked your world and changed the dynamic entirely, or you've had this long maturing process, I would think, right? I would say so. I sat in on several different interviews, and it, it felt like a firing squad to me. And because you have about 10 people, very experienced people who know their stuff, asking you very in-depth and deep questions. You know, what do you think about imagination? You know, what do you think a story is? And things that, especially if you're young, because t people that tend to go into the apprenticeship program tend to be young, may not have had time to really think about and flesh out. So it was really interesting to watch people 
having to come up with these answers on the fly, you can kind of see, did they really think in depth about where they're going as a writer, who they want to be, what their goals are, and then also just their philosophy of writing, and have they really formulated that yet? So it was really interesting. I was actually really glad that I didn't have the same interview experience when I came to work for Odyssey, because I was like, man, some of these people have, are really having to think deep and pull you know, from um, this well that they've built and they've grown. So again, I think this is why we have such quality people. They're really careful to find people that have cultivated that part of their story. And I love that angle because it's so easy as you think about developing yourself as an artist, there are so many things you can focus on, right? You can focus on the technique, the craft itself. You can focus on being in community with other people who know the same technique so that they can kind of rub off on you. You can focus on uh, how to run a business as an artist, how to make money off of it. And um, maybe you're taking care of yourself spiritually. Uh, that may or may not be terribly integrated into the rest of what you do. But to think of yourself as a creator, as a whole in that way, there aren't a lot of books on that. No, there's not. not. There's, you can't take a class on that in college. You really can't. I tried pitching a book on how to become an Odyssey writer, but never really got anywhere. <laughs> You're pitching it right now, and it's still not going so, anywhere. So, to whom it may concern. But let's also, something I'm also interested here is your selection of the voice actors, because from what I've seen, and I been trying to get more into audio drama, I've been trying to listen to different ones, and I have noticed that you can really, really tell if a voice actor is good or if it's somebody's buddy who they brought in. And getting high quality voice talent is very, very hard and very, very necessary. And I can guess it's very hard to do working within the constraints of, say, a ministry budget. So how do you pull off this alchemy? So I was an actress. And I've done a little, I mean, a little bit of voice acting with Odyssey. It is so hard and it's so different than any other types of acting. And I'm so impressed with really good voice actors because it's almost an impossible task because they have to explain everything with their voice, mm -hmm. everything that's going on, all the action, all the extra sounds, everything that they do comes only from their voice. And that can be really hard for actors who are used to an audience, who are used to costumes, other people on the stage with them. So they're definitely a rare breed. But part of the reason we became a union show, so we became a union show probably about 15 years ago, was to help find that quality because we re it's really important that Odyssey stays at a high quality. And so we work with agencies in California. We work with actors who are very established actors. And that really brings that quality and that um, extra little bit to kind of what we do and to voice acting. It is a totally different thing. We're going to have Mark Hamill on a follow-up show, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, special announcement. Um, <laughs> but I guess a related question to that is when you're looking for voice actors, are you looking, are these mainly people who try to get into like on screen acting or did they sort of go down this voice acting track early on? How do you, how do you pick these people out? Okay. So it's a really wide variety. It can be both. We have people. So Greg Jabara, who is one of our main actors, he is an actor on Blue Bloods. So he is often in New York recording and we're working around his recording schedule. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of actors that are currently on TV shows, mostly because their schedules are really hard to work around. And because we record in California, we have to really be able to work well with their schedule. But we do make an exception for Greg. Now, how we get these actors, and this is something I was doing all day today, is we create sides based off our script. I will send them to each agency that we work with based on what kind of actors they have. Some of them represent a wide range, some only children, some only adults. So I'll send them what they represent, and then they're going to send me back a voice sample of their actors reading the script. Now, if we have a 20-year-old American girl or boy, we'll probably get 100 submissions. <laughs> if we have, like right now, a Scottish six-year-old, I'm hoping we get five or six submissions. So it can be a really wide range of people that we get to choose from. 
but normally we get a really good selection from our agents. Then what happens is we start to listen through, and usually our executive producer will listen through every single one, because that can be about 800 plus audition submissions that have to be listened to, and he will narrow it down. And once he narrows it down, then other members of the team will come in and listen to those selections, and then we'll start narrowing it down even more. We eventually get to about three to five candidates, and we'll do a phone audition. So at that point, I'll usually rewrite sides and send those on to the agencies. We do this on the phone, which is unusual. VoiceOver doesn't normally need to do that, but most VoiceOver people live in California. Since we live in Colorado, we call them and we do it over the phone. The quality can be so-so, but it gives us an idea of their Mm -hmm. acting ability. We've already got their voice, so we kind of know what their voice is like. Now we're trying to check in their acting ability. And this is something that is really tricky once we get into selecting actors because Odyssey is very, very different than most voiceover. You don't say. Yes. So a lot of theater people do really well with Odyssey uh, because they're used to using their voice in different ways. Mm -hmm. But it really kind of just depends on the actor and how they're able to take direction. So in phone auditions, the main thing that we're looking for is, do they take direction well? Can they change? Is this the Uh only type of character that they're going to be able to do? Or are they able to go a completely different direction? A lot of times, our director will ask them to do something that I know we're not going to actually do in recording, but it's just to see their flexibility as an actor. Can they play more than one just one note? Because most voiceover, they're just going in, they're reading a line, and then they're leaving. In Odyssey, we record family style. So family style means all of the actors are in the same room together interacting. So again, it's very similar to theater and how we actually produce what we're doing. Let's maybe transition a little bit now to, I've been thinking about the different benefits of having a radio drama. So I'm just sort of thinking here, like what if instead of a radio drama, they decided to do like a, an Adventures in Odyssey cartoon, which they had Adventures in Odyssey cartoons. I don't think they're still going. But what are the benefits of doing a radio drama as opposed to a television show or something like that, that really the benefits of the medium? I think as a parent, so I've got three kids and two of them are in that demographic. Mm -hmm. And so something that I really like about Odyssey and things similar is that it uses their imagination and their mind in a different way. Mm -hmm. So they're not as passive as they would be maybe sitting in front of a video game or a television show. They're interacting more with their imagination. They're picturing things in their head. And so they're really interacting more with the story instead of just kind of sitting back and passively letting the story happen to them. And I would say I experienced that a lot as a child. Mm -hmm. Odyssey was a really big part of cultivating my own imagination Mm -hmm. and my own love of stories. And I think just the difference in medium makes you work harder. You know, you're not getting it from all the senses. You're only getting it from one sense. You have to create the rest of it in your mind. And I'll I'll sort of chime in with a couple other. I I was thinking of just my experience listening to it as a kid. First of all, like you said, absolutely. You're you're more actively engaged with the art when it's just audio because you have to imagine everything. You have to imagine what each character looks like, where the scene is, what the action is. It's a lot of work in a good sense of it. And second, it's very practical, but you can do things in an audio drama that you could never do if you were like filming it. I I was listening to a really interesting podcast about the history of the golden age of radio. And they were talking about how in that genre, especially in like the 30s and 40s, sci-fi really flourished. And one of the reasons was they could get away with things uh, with audio that you could never do with the technology they had at the time. You know, they could have alien creatures and the audience is imagining the alien creature and it's not some tacky effect that would look dated five years later. So whereas you may not have the budget to do the Search for Wit uh, series that took place all in Israel and it's this big like Indiana Jones expedition, you can't do a movie of that, but you can absolutely do that on audio and it works just fine. And Another thing is you can get really attached to the way that you picture it. I remember when they came out with the cartoon version. They did, you know, a handful of those back when I was a kid. 
I, I am not throwing any shade at the artists. I'm sure they did a great job. I was super disappointed with how Wits End looked because that's not how I pictured it. I had a very specific picture. That's not how it was. And finally, I just feel like that helped my skills as a listener. I feel like I absorb information. What is it? If you're, you're an auditory listener, what were the other types? Tactile or something, something. Visual. I feel like Adventures in Odyssey created a generation of evangelical race kids who are auditory learners because of this. It, it was just really beneficial for me. So, Brian, <laughs> do you feel deprived of this as a child, or did you listen to your one episode so many times that you got all these benefits? Well, it's funny. I think part of the reason we didn't get into it was because before we realized it was a thing, we'd gotten into audiobooks and radio dramas and mm -hmm. other contexts. I mean, we you have to understand, I grew up in a three-bedroom house. It was, oh gosh, maybe 1,300 square feet. And there were at least four bookshelves in every single room in the house, uh, except the bathrooms, and even those had bookshelves in them after a while. <laughs> and there were entire rooms of floor-to-ceiling bookshelves that were entirely radio dramas and books on tape. So it wasn't so much that I missed... I missed Odyssey specifically, but I didn't miss that particular way of learning, that particular way of processing information. All right, and that's actually, Brian, uh, this is just the synergy between Redeemed Imagination and Believe to See. That was a great segue into something I wanted to talk to Jennifer about, is Folks on Family did branch out into other things beyond Adventures in Odyssey. There was a focused radio theater, which sort of went to do adaptations of famous books, other things like that. How was that different from what you saw of the, how the process worked in terms of adapting? Like they did a really great adaptation of The Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, and that is excellent. I've listened to that with my kids several times. and I just absolutely adore it every time. But radio theater is actually created by the same team. So the same department that I'm in, we actually do radio theater and Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And radio theater isn't as regular as Odyssey is right now. But it's a lot of the same process, the same writers, same sound engineers, same directors. The main difference is when we do radio theater, we actually record it in England. So we're bringing in English actors instead of American actors. And that's just slightly different in how we do it. So I don't have to cast those shows. There's actually a casting director in England that mm -hmm. will do all of the casting for us. And it's just slightly different. But for the main thing is that the quality, I think, is just as good as Odyssey, again, because we have using a lot of the same creative team, the same creative people, and are still looking for really high quality actors. And I think both of those things put together is kind of what makes such a great product. So a big thanks to Jennifer England. Really appreciate her visiting the show. And if you all have not listened to Adventures in Odyssey, go ahead and check it out. You don't have a good excuse, so just do it. Uh, so now, uh, Jennifer had to leave, but there was another segment that I wanted to do called, well, I'm calling it, the Odyssey Lightning Round. And for this, I needed an Odyssey super fan, so I thought, hey, let's let's invite my brother. Uh, you all may recall me talking, uh, well, complaining about my lazy artist brother who is too busy... Uh, caring for his triplets to do all the art projects that I assign him. Well, he's here in the car with me now. And one month old baby too. Uh, okay, so he has triplets and a one month old baby. <laughs> yeah. So the the point is, uh, I brought him on the show to discuss what I'm calling Adventures in Odyssey Lightning Round. So Brian Melma, say hello to everybody. Hello. Do you want to defend yourself other than saying you have to care for your four children? No, I think that's a pretty good argument right there. Yeah, we'll leave it to the audience. Uh, so what I, what I want to do now is have a series of lightning round questions that we that we will both answer. Uh, question number one is something I've been wondering for a long time. Wanted to get your take. What state do you think the town of Odyssey is in? I have always assumed it's in Ohio. Oh. My logic behind this, I haven't been to Ohio, in full disclosure, but... I have the sense it's a little more mountainy, like they have hills and that kind of stuff there, at the very least. And Odyssey, they always talk about going hiking, like, kind of in the mountains of some sort. Okay. And it seems like that kind of region has been thrown out by Odyssey fandom as a possible location. 
Okay, so I, I will say, if, if I understand it correctly, the general consensus in Odyssey fandom is for Ohio, mm -hmm. but you and them are both wrong, and I will explain to you why. Go for it. Odyssey is clearly in central Illinois, <laughs> and here's why. First of all, we know that the Odyssey is in the Midwest. They've said this repeatedly, and that you know that that's pretty well established. So already we're down to what is it? Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, maybe Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, but we're we're probably looking Illinois, Ohio, or Indiana. So what's the biggest clue that we have? The biggest clue is the city of Chicago. Any time that anybody in Odyssey is going to the big city, it's always Chicago. It's never New York, it's never Cleveland, Cincinnati, it's never St. Louis, Minneapolis, it's always Chicago. That tells me that it's it's in central Illinois, not so close that it'd be closer to St. Louis, but it's in that area, so whenever they're like, oh, the big city, it's Chicago. Let me have some pushback on this, though. They always fly to Chicago. Why wouldn't they just drive to Chicago if they're in central Illinois? And Cleveland, no offense to people from Cleveland, but that just seems like a boring city. Why would you go to the big city of Cleveland? Chicago seems just more happening. Like, there's stuff going on in Chicago. Nothing happens in Cleveland. Okay, your flight thing's a good point. I'll yeah. give you that. But I still think if they if they were in Ohio, there'd be episodes like, hey, we're going to we're going to Cincinnati for the day or but Columbus. You can't give them too much away because they're it's very secretive about where like odyssey is so they wouldn't be like hey we're going to the closest big city of cleveland <laughs> <laughs> and technically the closest like city is connellsville which is another made-up one so they drive to connellsville if they want to go to the city as it were but the big city is chicago which i would argue like the three main cities in america is like new york chicago la that's what you think of as the big cities. But and Chicago is the closest city to Ohio. Not really though, because Ohio is basically midway between Chicago and New York. Like I think Akron's like at the midpoint between it. So I mean, it's like the city of the Midwest though. Yeah, I guess New York's like East Coast. That's a totally different thing than the Midwest. So Chicago still has like the Midwest vibe. So you're saying even even if it's geographically equidistant between New York yeah. and Chicago. It's, it's culturally more Chicago. Yes. I guess that makes sense. Uh, agree to disagree on lightning round. Question number I think one. I won that argument. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, so question number two. This one's a little bit more open-ended. If you could do any Imagination Station adventure, what would you do? Oh, this one's tough. So let, let's start off with a question I had when I was trying to answer this. The Imagination Station, do you have to go back in history, or can you go into, like, a book? Because we can do that. Yeah, it's you like can, You can go into, like, other things, because there's that episode with, um, I forget who it's with, but they go into the Zapazoids video game. Oh, that's a good one. That's with Dwayne and Jared. Dwayne and Jared, yep. So you can go into non-historical which opens it up a little too much for this question, I think. Well, because I was going to say, it's like, oh, okay, I'll go to, like, Middle Earth or something. I'll go yeah. to Narnia. Yep. I'll go hang out at the Jedi Temple in Coruscant. Yeah. No, actually, at Naboo. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess for this, we're, we're constraining ourselves to, like, history. Are these, like, ones that they've had on the show? Not necessarily. Or I can pick anything. 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 Let your imagination run wild. Place of wonder, it's excitement, very, and imagination. It's a very Mr. Whitaker thing to say. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I think... T -t -t -t. Hmm. Are we going to cut this if I think too long? Uh, it depends. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll just let you dangle. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so I think it would be super fun. I am picturing, I am picturing a Middle Ages like tournament with jousts and everything. Okay. I have some Odyssey precedent for it because remember Isaac the Courageous or something when yep. the knight steps out of the Imagination Station. Yeah. Yep. So I think people would say, well, you know, real tournaments weren't all the glitz and glamour that you see like King Arthur, but. We have precedence for that. So I want to go. 
don't know if I actually want to be in the armor, but I'll go watch, you know, drink okay. some, what did they drink there? Hot mead in yeah. the stands to eat cat meat, whatever they did in the Middle Ages. That'd be fun. I can respect that. Go watch I, uh, Sir Sir William take on the Dark Knight. Okay, I think I got it. I think I would go to the American Old West. Oh. So I could be a cowboy. <laughs> and I could do like a crossing of America on a horse, driving the cattle. I rode across the desert on a horse with no name. Exactly. That's, that's one of Dad's favorite songs. I don't know what yeah. it's from. I think that would be fun. Well... So here's a question though, which is a weird one out of all history. That's why you're picked, you're picking. You want to I ride want a to horse <laughs> across Kansas <laughs> with a bunch of cows all by yourself? No, that I'd is your peak like, in I'd his, with all like, of history. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be with outlaws or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's even better. <laughs> Maybe we'd rob a train. That sounds yeah, like G- a very Adventures and Odyssey thing to do. <laughs> it's a Jesse James game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it's a nice little dark direction to take. You're using the imagination station to live out like crime fantasies. <laughs> I don't have any crime fantasies that I know of, but I guess I do. <laughs> I mean, I apparently wanna be, you, you want to ro- rob wanna banks. Rob trains. <laughs> wow, that one is interesting. <laughs> Sorry that I revealed this in your son, Mom. I, I didn't know Brian was secretly wanted to be a train robber. Uh, but anyway, this one is should... Maybe I could, more like, <laughs> He's walking it back. <laughs> Maybe more like... I'm a good guy fighting the outlaws. Oh, oh, okay. We'll go that direction. There we go. Or maybe you're you're like a Robin Hood type. Like there's yeah. all these like robber barons oppressing yep. people and you're you're robbing those trains. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good save. But I'm still sticking with it. All right. So, new one. Let's let's go a different direction here. So, when you're listening to this as a boy, were there any characters you had a crush on? Who's your Odyssey crush? Yeah, Katrina. Katrina? Yep. Really? Yeah. What, what what about Katrina? I don't know. I just <laughs> her voice. Her voice was just something about her voice that I found attractive. It, it's a very pleasant voice. It is. Very very smart. Very thoughtful. And I feel like in all the like non Katrina roles that she plays, like when she's an invent like a, um, a imagination station character, she's always like, you know, like the heartthrob. <laughs> So do you have a specific way that you picture Katrina? No, I just always found her attractive. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good answer. Yeah. Now, I thought about bringing our mom in on this. She obviously would have said Jason Whitaker. Duh. Yeah. I haven't even asked her about it. I just know. Did you Um, have one? Oh, of course. Do you remember when I was a kid, uh, there's this character, Julie. She was there with uh, Dwayne and Jared. Uh, Yeah. One of those. I don't know why. I had a crush on Julie. Okay. None of the other girls. I didn't even have a clear picture. It was like, Julie's the girl for me. Supposedly, Lucy turned out to be quite the looker. Really? Yeah, because there's that episode where all the old characters come back. And it's like Dwayne and Jimmy and one other that are all like fighting over Lucy. Oh, my. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. They did not set her up as that. I know. I, well, well yeah. good, good for you, Lucy. Yep. She turned out to be quite the looker. <laughs> okay, so fi- final question of the lightning round. Let's say they're they're making an Adventures in Odyssey movie. Yep. It becomes a valuable IP and Hollywood just gobbles it up. We're casting Mr. Whitaker, Connie, and Eugene. We could cast like other kids too. I, I don't know who the kids are. I'm Stranger Things kids, whatever. Okay. So, but just those three main ones. Right? Just those three main ones. You can throw in other ones if you want to overachieve. Okay. okay. Right. Let's let's start. We'll go one at a time. Who do you have as Mr. Whitaker? Okay. And I can choose from, like, any time of acting history. I guess. I kind of... Uh, mine would all work in present day. Okay, because the if one you wanna, I have if you wanna, mind, does If you want to cheat, go ahead. he's dead. Well, that would be difficult. But old Andy Griffith. Oh, that's a good one. When he starts to get plump. Yeah, so like Matlock, Andy Griffith. Yes. Like, that's Mr. Whitaker to me. Oh, it's, even without the mustache. He could grow a mustache for it, but yeah. Even now, without the mustache, he pulls it off. How do you picture Mr. Whitaker? Because he went through a lot of different, the like... 90s cartoon one. So the one where he's a little bit plumper? Yeah. That's how I picture him, too. Yep. They tried to, like, slim him down. I guess he, like, I don't yeah. know, got a Peloton or something. Never viewed him that way. Yeah, I agree. So Andy Griffith is good. So what we could do is, you know, like uh, in Rogue One, they had that dead uh, Empire guy. They just like CG'd him. 
Yeah. Maybe we could get uh, the CG Andy Griffith. I like the sound of that. Okay, so... Which I think ties well, too, because the drunk in the Andy Griffith show was Mr. Whitaker. There you go. That That is a real bit of it trivia all comes there. together. So, my choice... This was inspired by very recent events. I'm going with America's favorite man, Tom Hanks. I can see that. I was skeptical of if he could pull off Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the movie, but apparently it's very good. So I think if he can do that, he can be Mr. Whitaker. Mr. Whitaker, Tom Hanks, both like, oh, I trust him. I agree with that. I could also see Tom Hanks as like a Jack Allen, too, though. Oh, that's a good one. I might want to say him for... So maybe we could have CGI uh, ghost of Andy Griffith <coughs> and uh, then yeah. Jack Kelly could be Tom <laughs> Hanks. Okay, who's your, who's your Connie? Okay, I have to give credit to your wife for this one. Oh. Because um, I was thinking about this one and Danielle brought up Amy Adams. Mm-hmm. And I think a young Amy Adams, like beginning of her career. Oh, so like when she, she was on like the first season of The Office, Amy Adams. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think she would make a great Connie. That's a good one. She has that sort of energy. And she ha- she can have the bubbly yeah. part of it, too, because, like, Enchanted, she yeah. can, like, play that kind of role, that too. classic, like, Disney princess thing. She yep. can also be a little bit more normal. Yep. So I think... And she has a good look for it, too. Yeah, the redhead. Do you picture Connie as a redhead? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So mine, I was trying to put two things together in my head. One, Connie is 16 years old. Two, she's been 16 since the mid-80s. Yep. So I'm trying to think, who's somebody who looks perpetually 16? And one name came. I, I think this is the only one it could possibly be. Emma Stone. That I can see, too. Because if you look at Emma Stone, I wikipedia this, she's like 31 or something. But she has this face, you know, with her eyes. I don't know how it works, but she looks just perpetually young. Yep. Like, I can't believe she's in her 30s. So I would say... Emma Stone would make a really good Connie because, like, how old is she? I don't know. Connie I might li- change my mind to that. I think oh, you thank might have you. brought me a... Yeah. Thank I you. I think Emma Stone would make a and good one. Plus, I think she has the right the right energy, too. Yep. Yeah. yeah you know? I agree with you. A- young Amy Adams would still work, too. But. Yes. And Emma Stone doesn't have the effervescence of Amy Adams, but I think yeah. she could have a little bit of Connie's, like, edge. Yes. Because Connie does have an edge. She does. That's a good one. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. So, final one, Eugene. All right, this one... Yeah, I, this one I had a lot of trouble with thinking of somebody. I actually have two I feel really psyched about. Okay. I, could, I could loan yep. you one, but I want I you to, am, I want to, I I want am, to hear who you came up with. I am convinced you're going to convince me out of mine and into yours. Okay. Um, but the only person I could really think of that like fits like my like visual picture of Eugene and also have like that... like ability to have the nerdy smartness is and correct me if i get his name wrong there are a lot of excuses for this already (laughs) but jim parsons who plays sheldon on big bang theory oh because he's tall and skinny he's not terrible the only thing about him he kind of like on big bang theory and i think just in general he seems a little too like uppity about his smarts well, I was Where just going to say... Eugene's not as much like... In the beginning, he is, but not like Eugene proper. Yes. not So not quite so like um, domineering with his intelligence. Yes. So, he doesn't have that lovable aspect to him, but I'm like, I can't... Yeah. So I will say, I have never seen Jim Parsons in any role other than Sheldon. I know, and that's where so I... So that, that's where I struggle. I know, that's why I'm like, I don't know if I can get my head around him too much with that, but... Yeah, I'm open to your... Okay, so I'll give my my second choice. I I was going back and forth. This is my second choice, and I'll give my first choice. Second choice, Bill Hader from Saturday Night Live. He's been, you know, on lots of other stuff. He's most famous because he's Stefan on (laughs) on Weekend Update. He's tall, he's skinny. I think he could give that sort of goofy vibe out there. But the better one, kind of similar, I think the best choice for Eugene is Will Forte. So, also on SNL, longtime cast member. Then he went, he was on uh, Last Man on Earth, so that guy. Yep. I think he seems goofy, lovable. He could be very, he could come across as very smart as you, if you want. Same sort of build and body type. I, I think he'd do a great job. Will, the part is yours if you want it. What, what do you think? Those are decent. 
I feel like they're neither of them is like. <laughs> I still feel like they need to lose a lot of weight, and neither of them come off as like geniuses to me either. Well, they could be smart, but not like Eugene genius. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I I, th- I think Will Forte could do it. Okay. He's he's been lots of different characters. I won't argue with it, because I don't know if mine's much better, but. <laughs> I think we need to find somebody, like, new and upcoming. Oh. In all honesty. Okay, so you think we need a younger Eugene? Yeah, just somebody that's not in the mainstream, because I can't Ooh. think of anybody. Ooh. Like, yeah. I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll leave that up to, to all you listeners out there. If you know a good Eugene, let, let us know. We're obviously flailing here. In all honesty, um, I don't know... If I can say this, but the person that I picture as Eugene the most is Nathan Hubler, who is one of the producers on Odyssey. <laughs> he just looks Eugene. Really? To me. I do not picture Nathan Hubler as looking like Eugene. Yeah, he's Eugene to me. Okay. Well, Nathan, there you go. Yeah. So there's that. There's that. All right. Well, thank you for doing the lightning round, Brian. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. <laughs> That was very formal. Thank you. (laughs) So once again, thank you all for listening to Believe to See. And you you all may have noticed that I'm still struggling to come up with a nice closing thing now that I've run out of St. Anselm quotations. So I'm going to give you no clever parting, but I will say thank you again for listening and we'll see you next time.